Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi ta'ala wabarakatuh and hello everyone. Uh, my name is Azmi Aris. I am from Faculty of Engineering UTM and currently I am attached to the Center for Environmental of Sustainability and Water Security. I would like to welcome everyone to our uh, UTM Faculty of Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series number 91 and today uh, we are so fortunate that we are having uh, Professor Miguel Peña Veron from Universidad del Valle uh, of Colombia. Hi, Professor. How are you doing? I hope uh, everybody is uh, doing well. Uh, I would like to thank Professor Miguel uh, for having uh, his time to be with us today. For uh, this over there, it is, I believe, around 8 p.m at night uh, but uh, we are lucky to have him uh, despite the odd time at this hour for, for him. Uh, I have known Professor uh, Peña Veron uh, for I think about three years ago uh, when uh, we first applied for UKRI GCRF uh, fund and Alhamdulillah, we managed to secure that fund along with uh, Newcastle University and also our collaborator from India and also from Ethiopia. And since uh, that moment, uh, we are uh, engaged with uh, collaborative activities and program. Uh, we meet, I met him uh, every, every, every month. We have meeting to discuss on our collaboration on water security. So the project is looking at the water security issues in different countries, uh, in Malaysia, in India, Ethiopia, and also in Colombia. And we share our expertise and also our experience dealing with uh, different uh, issues in our own country. And in fact, uh, recently, uh, we just completed our third annual assembly, which was conducted online. We're supposed to go to Colombia uh, this time around, but unfortunately, due to the uh, COVID, we were only able to do it online, but it was hosted uh, nicely uh, by the Colombian uh, partner. So, uh, and we are having this uh, meeting and uh, collaboration uh, from time to time. And in fact, uh, tomorrow we will be discussing on how uh, we will be working on our communities uh, with regards of the environmental awareness in different countries. So the Colombian partner will be sharing with us uh, their experience with their communities and we hope to uh, also share our experience. Uh, without uh, further ado, I think uh, I would like to pass this uh, screen uh, to Professor Rafiq uh, to have some words and also intro introduce uh, Professor Venia uh, to, to us. Thank you, Professor Azmi Aris. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Welcome everyone to our 91st, uh, 91st UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Muhammad Rafiq and I am the Dean of Engineering University Technology Malaysia. Today, it is my utmost pleasure to welcome Professor Miguel Peña Varon from Universidad del Val, Colombia. A bit about our speaker today. Miguel Peña Varon is full professor in environmental science and engineering at the Universidad del Val in Cali, Colombia. He was former director of CINRA Chinara Institute at the Faculty of Engineering period 2014 to 2017. Professor Peña is a sanitary engineer from Universidad del Val, earned his MSc degree in engineering and tropical public health from the University of Leeds, United Kingdom, and is also a PhD from the same British university. He is currently a candidate for a Master of Arts degree in philosophy at the Department of Philosophy of the Universidad del Val with a dissertation on environmental ethics. Professor Peña is a researcher in the areas of ecological engineering to solve environmental pollution problems. 
He also works on environmental health issues, specifically on the topic of environmental pollution and its impact on human health. In the last 10 years, he started a new area of research on environmental ethics as a framework to analyze conflicts in the society-nature relationship. He is also the author of several international articles in renowned environmental science and environmental engineering journals, has written several book chapters in co-authorship, and is currently finishing the writing of two books on the subject of eco-technologies for bioremediation of aquatic pollution. Professor Peña was formerly an associate editor of Water Science and Technology Journal at the International Water Association, IWA, in the period 2011 to 2019. He is currently being appointed as review editor of the International Journal of Public Health at Frontier's Open Access Publishing System. So that is a brief biography of our distinguished speaker. Here now is Professor Miguel Peña Baron from Universidad del Val, Colombia, with a lecture entitled Reflections from Environmental Philosophy to Analyze the Society-Nature Relationships. Professor Miguel Benoit Baron, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Rafik and Professor Azmi. Uh, first of all, my, my thanks for inviting me to be part of this distinguished lecture series. And basically tonight, I hope to share with you um, some of the reflections from my previous work, more sort of, if you want to say, um, sort of natural science oriented, but also more recently with the philosophical uh, dimension in it as well. So it's like a sort of mix sort of reflection. I don't want, or I'm not gonna say any truth, I mean, today written on stone, rather I will deliver a sort of an open reflection. And I hope we have many uh, sort of questions where to talk to or to conversate about, right? So let me, I will share my screen in order to, to start the, the talk. Right, as Professor Rafik says, uh, my talk today is about reflections from environmental philosophy to analyze the society-nature relationship. And basically, uh, I want to do this by, excuse me, going on to the following contents for the presentation. Some notes first on the society-nature relationship. What do I mean by that? Then to talk about the triad, epistemology, ethics, and aesthetics. Then I will move into some core concepts to, to, to talk about this, the concept of representation, the concept of sentiment or moral judgment, and the concept of aesthetic judgment. And then some final considerations to close up the, uh, the talk. Um, just before starting, just let me give you a little bit of reference to my country of origin, Colombia. Colombia is a South American country. We are right on the top left hand corner of South America. And we make the link with Central America. So our neighboring country from Central America is Panama. Later on, I am gonna show a map and then I will point out uh, where Colombia is. Colombia is a sort of, um, sort of privileged country in South America, actually, because we have the two oceans, Atlantic Ocean on one of our coasts and the Pacific Ocean on the other. We are about 45 million people currently, and about 65% of that population live in the urban areas and some 35% in rural areas. They are basically a sort of industrializing, developing sort of country with an economy depending mostly on, on agriculture and more recently, some growth of the industrial and commerce uh, sectors as well. Right, uh, uh, let's then start the talk with the relationship between society and nature. And what do I mean by that? Well, basically the first thing to say is that this relationship occurs in a specific context and is both a process and a historical outcome. What do I mean by this? I mean, if you look at 
this um, relation in terms of a, a, a historical outcome, we could say actually that the current environmental or ecological crisis is an outcome that has a history before it. So we are at this point, not for free or for unknown reasons, we know the reasons, and we can look at those reasons way back in history, at least two or three centuries before us, when this uh, sort of crisis started. Um, and if we look at it in terms of process, then we can go in the, you know, in the timeline from actually thousands of years ago up to now. So we can look at this uh, society nature in those two aspects, right? As a sort of a cut in history in a given time, or also as a historical process. And I think it's good to see it both ways in order to understand better how this society nature is molded a long time and depending on these uh, interrelations between natural systems and social systems. The other thing to say, if you look at it as a historical process, is that human agency began from the Upper Neolithic period, because then was when agriculture and grazing activities uh, make us sedentary population. And in that way, those two very important, uh, I, I could say technological events, gave rise to the agrarian societies as we know them, then the metal age came in, then they uh, appeared the writing, and then also the civilizations as we know them today. And in all this uh, historical process, it's important to point out a very important event in this, in this um, uh, society nature relationship. First, we have the village as a basic urban unit, and then the city, and those two arose. And because of that, the crowding of people in, in, in um, smaller spaces gave the rise to the first, you know, uh, zoonosis that appeared because of the domestication of animals at the time, you see? Uh, we are up today suffering a pandemic, right? Uh, and in a way, urbanization uh, process uh, is a high risk factor for the transmission of this sort of diseases, yeah, infectious diseases in general, and zoonosis in particular. Um, and now, if we look at it in a more sort of recent time, let's say the modern era, about two, two and a half centuries ago, our human capacity was and is triggered by the industrialization process, also the scientific and technological advancements, also the relations of commerce between nations worldwide, and also the modes of production. I mean, the, the big two modes of production we've known during this period, you know, communism and capitalism, both are born in the modern era. And then attached to those, then the development conceptions also arose. Um, one of the very first econo uh, development conceptions was the economic development conception, conception then the social development, then the sustainable development, and more recently, the human uh, sustainable development, right? So we can see that development as a noun has been sort of qualified by adjectives, you know, like social, sustainable, human, but all of them center mostly, not to say exclusively, on economic development or the increase of wealth worldwide. And you know that is this very um, conventional economic indicators to judge economic development, like the uh, gross domestic product, the GNP, etc. But what is at the heart always of the any of these uh, conception, conceptions of development is this um, binary relationship, you know, conservation of nature, of natural species, uh, spaces or ecosystems, versus economic growth. So there's always this sort of conflict or conflictive relationship. How much do we grow economically? How much we conserve natural spaces or ecosystems in order to keep life and well-being going on? So that's always at the heart of the equation. Um, and that's, I may say, that's like the standard and here I'm talking more from the Western society, right? I'm, I'm not actually um, recalling here 
uh, other conceptions, but mostly the Western conception of development, right? Uh, however, in, 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 in subcontinents like South America, for instance, there have been other alternatives recently being sort of uh, shown and argued, like Sumacausai. Sumacausai is, um, is a term from the Quechua indigenous language that means good living. And good living in this regard is not only having, you know, a high um, domestic gross product or anything like that, but it's rather being in a community of collaboration, a community, an empathic community, a community of social bonds, etc. So it's not economic wealth is not the center of this vision of the good living. And if we move to Africa, for instance, in Africa, we may find something similar, which is the Ubuntu philosophy, which is this, this philosophy of humanity in us as individuals, being an expression of humanity for the whole group. And also collaboration, empathy, support among people is important in Ubuntu philosophy. So you see that there are other alternatives that which are not um, exclusively centered on the main paradigm of Western societies, which is the economic sort of wealth paradigm. So you can see then that society nature is a sort of very, um, I, I could say, polysemic concept, you know, is not an unique standard meaning to it, right? Having said that, I would like to go back again and show where all this started, you know. If we go to um, paleontological and archaeological work, Roy 2010 published this very nice world map showing the genesis cores of agriculture in the Upper Neolithic, right? And you can see here, you know, this is um, North America. This is Central America. This is South America. By the way, this is Colombia, the one I am pointing out right now. This is the co my country. And this is the Caribbean and the Atlantic Ocean. And this is the Pacific Ocean. And this is our geography. And our neighbors are Ecuador, Peru, uh, Bolivia, Brazil, and Venezuela, right? Uh, and this map is just to show that independently in those five hot spots, agriculture uh, was born, right? And you can see uh, the Middle East and also the uh, Far East, right? China, this is where about today is Afghanistan, Iran, and also in Oceania, right? And this pointed um, area here highlighted is still in discussion, you know, this is the Sub-Saharan Africa, where there seems to be another nuclei of agricultural race in the Neolith Upper Neolithic. Right, and then the arrows just show how all this um, knowledge of agriculture was irradiated to the rest of the territories in each continent from uh, between 8,500 and 6,000 BC. Right, and same here how this was radiated to the rest of the world. So this is a very important um, sort of milestone in the in the human in the society nature history. And another big milestone is the, as I was saying before, the, the appearing of villages and cities. And today, as, as I was saying, about two thirds world population living in urban areas. And this is just basically a very generic uh, sort of picture that try to show us how um, the cities settle in the territory, usually very close to uh, water resources and also uh, mountains, uh, giving different sorts of uh, inputs and materials to make possible life in cities. There are some, there's some legend here of based on colors and, and the meaning of those colors. The red is are the natural stores of materials or resources, natural resources. Uh, the blue are natural fluxes like this, for instance, the snowfall, sublimation of, you know, water, discharge, runoff, rain, natural fluxes. And the uh, black color are 
the human fluxes and infrastructure, basically the city. And these uh, big arrows are showing, for instance, in this case, the main uh, fluxes going into cities to make life possible in cities. For instance, water flux is a really important flux for any city. Then follows the uh, food fluxes as well, you know, the, the, the input of food to population in cities, and also the power flux, right? So you can see then that we need very specific natural fluxes to make possible life on uh, urban settings. And um, in exchange for that, I mean, going into, for instance, metabolism, what well, we uh, get back to the environment are waste fluxes, you know, like wastewater, like um, solid waste, like um, atmospheric emissions, you know, pollution for both, I mean, for all the abiotic matrix, for water, for pollution for soils, pollution for the uh, air in the atmosphere. And also a byproduct from all this uh, urban metabolism is the heat flux. We give back to the environment a lot of heat. And all of this, um, contributes to the increase of entropy of the whole system, right? And this is how the ecological crisis manifests nowadays, you know. Ent entropy is growing um, more rapidly than ever before because the use of all these fluxes is very, very high. And the capacity of the planet to recover from that massive use, uh, I mean, is, is behind. The actual, the, I mean, the, uh, there's a difference between the rate of use and the rate of regeneration, as, as you probably know already, you know, this is not anything new really, but just trying to show here very, very graphically how this works. And of course, we are almost two thirds of us, human people, live in these urban environments, demanding lots and lots of natural um, resources and fluxes of those resources. So this is the second milestone, which is very important to take into account when talking about society and nature relationships. Right, this is a very nice plot that I got from, a, from a, an author recently, trying to show the integration of how social and ecological dimensions can merge together. And, and it's giving here some timeline. For instance, um, before 1960 in the last century, uh, the human systems or social systems and natural systems were dealt with apart. There was no relation between them. We didn't even think of if we have any uh, relation to nature. We thought of it as a, I could say, as a stock of unlimited resources for human purposes. And we look at it like that, right? Uh, however, at that at that time, the very first, um, in terms of public policy, the very first thing that came out was the protection of natural areas or natural parks, as we call it in Colombia, or natural forest areas to be protected. Between the 1960 and 1980, there was um, a recognition, uh, I mean, epistemologically and more widely, that humans, we humans were affecting nature and were impacting the quality of ecosystems. Therefore, the very first regulations for clean water, for instance, and clean air came out during this period between 1960 and 1980, right? Then between the 1990 and the 2000, the, the very last decade of the last century, uh, there was a new recognition that nature was giving us all we need to uh, be able to live and survive and have a, a level of well-being. And then a new paradigm came out, as you probably have heard, you know, the payment for ecosystem services. Now, nature is giving us services, and so we depend on those to be able to live uh, uh, and have sort of economic development or human development or sustainable development or any of those developments I was mentioning earlier, right? And more recently, between 2010 and now, basically the, la the very last decade, 
we are recognizing that there is an interconnection and interdependence between human systems or social systems and natural systems, right? And there is a two-way or bidirectional relationship between those two systems, right? These systems co-evolve and co-adapt together, right? And so, um, therefore, we are now thinking of environmental conservation along with social welfare. And then the discourse of sustainability that is ingrained in this new conception we are now having and discussing around human or social systems and natural systems. Right. I want to move now to this triad, epistemology, ethics, and aesthetics. Um, I mean, this is a very, very sort of old concept, you know, you can find the very first um, version of this um, triad in the classic uh, Hellenistic period, you know, in the ancient Greek uh, philosophy, that we humans, you know, um, have always these um, questions about ourselves, who we are, how we learn about the world or about um, the environment surrounding us, and that's the big question for epistemology but we also worry about um what's the good thing to do what's the right thing to do you know how can we behave in a good manner and that's the question for ethics or the ethical question and also we have a a, a, a query about the beautiful about the sublime yeah and that's the question of aesthetics however when we are talking in environmental um, problems or environmental phenomenon or basically in the relationship, as I was saying, between society and nature, all these three categories are ingrained at once. Where? In our central nervous system, basically, in, in our intellect, right? And so these three dimensions are always interacting um, in us as human beings because we are capable of, you know, scientific knowledge, we are capable of art, and we are capable capable of asking ourselves the very big questions, you know, that, that, that the philosophy pursues. And so uh, the relationship between these three dimensions is quite quite important for a work in the environmental dimension, you know. The, the relation between ethics and epistemology has to do with the ethical and political use of knowledge. It seems to me that for us working in environmental science, we can't be naive to say that we, that, I mean, that we are politically neutral because, 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 because that's not true. I mean, most of the environmental conflicts and most of the environmental problems and situations to be solved have a very profound political root, right, in it. And so, I mean, we have to worry about ethics and epistemology, of course, as environmental scientists. And the um, relationship, for instance, between ethics and uh, ethics and aesthetics is that sentiment of the beautiful as good. Yeah, probably if you have read some some references or some words from deep ecology, you are um, constantly finding there in that in this field of inquiry this question. You know, whatever whatever process or whatever. Um, even in nature, which is beautiful, has to be good. Because um, uh, as probably one of the big philosophers, Spinoza says, um, nature has its own, reason, its own reason in itself, right? And it's um, beautiful per se. And that's a very um, profound ethical and aesthetical thinking about uh, nature. And of course, um, the aesthetic is a source of knowledge in terms of epistemology, right? Uh, and this is, um, for instance, in, in we, we call it in, in ancestral or in ancient communities or in ancient indigenous groups, we find this all the time, this, this strong bond between the beauty of nature and how that beauty is a way to develop practical knowledge. Uh, and very useful knowledge as well to, for instance, have a, a more harmonic life, uh, to be worth living 
uh, in any given environment or in any given uh, natural setting. So this is how these uh, three categories interact. And we think that's very important for the working environmental subjects. Right, I would like to move now into the, what are the key concepts then to try to analyze uh, this um, society and nature relationship. The very first concept is representation. Representation is a very uh, complex concept. Basically, a representation is made of our beliefs, our knowledge, uh, where this knowledge is both theoretical and practical, and also our system of values. So representation is a quite a complex concept. And usually representation has an individual dimension, but also a collective dimension. Usually representation is a social, is a social concept as well, right? And, and basically, the, the, why representation is important? Because we come from a very long tradition from the natural science, which is the tradition of reductionism. You know, the, the, the old Cartesian paradigm is that we have to reduce the systems to its parts in order to understand the complexity. So we have to reduce reality to very specific parts in order to give an account of it. However, in, environ in contemporary environmental science, uh, we are more worried about holism and complexity. Try to have a grasp of complexity. I mean, of course, it's not possible to, to have a full understanding of the whole complexity, but at least try to be less, I would say, reduction, reductionist in that sense, right? And one um, very important point that arouse, uh, arise here is these questions for us. What is our place in nature? Our place is our place as human species. What is our place in nature? It seems that question or the answer to the questions nowadays is not very clear, right? For us, it seems that we are like the gods of nature. You know, we can govern nature, we can control nature, we can do whatever with nature because we have knowledge, scientific knowledge and a lot of technology to do that, right? However, uh, still quite a few communities um, and probably the more native ones have another sort of conception of what is our place in nature. Probably they see themselves more ingrained into nature and basically as one more form of living in nature and in harmony with nature. So that question is highly contested nowadays, you know, in the, in, both in the, in the uh, philosophical debate, also in the social science debate and in the natural science debate as well. But there's no clear cut answer for that. Um, and in environmental ethics, there's a very hot discussion on that. You know, what is our place in nature? It's not clear, really. Yeah. Um, the second key uh, concept is the moral or ethical judgment, right? Because basically here, what is uh, at the heart of the contemporary discussion is the anthropocentric view that we have of the world, right? Basically, we think that... Um, I mean, the planet is a massive resource for us, for humans, right? And it's there for use. It's there for doing things, for creating new goods, for consuming things, right? And, and nature then is basically um, like a massive store where we can find everything we, we want or we need. However, um, the other, uh, I would say, extreme of, of ethical values opposed to anthropocentrism is biocentrism. And biocentrism puts the focus on life itself. I mean, what is important for biocentrism is the expression of life, diverse expression of life. All forms of life are important and are needed in order to have balance in the biosphere, you know, which is our, our habitat actually. And a more, even more, um, I would say, um, extreme conception is ecocentrism, where even, um, non-living things, non-living entities also have moral value. And this is the big, and this is the big, the big question. How we define the moral status of other entities? How we demarcate the moral community? That's the big question at the stake here in the environmental ethics discussion. 
what other entities are or deserve moral considerations from us, from humans, right? Because up to now, all the ethical theories are concerned with relations amongst us, amongst humans, but not concerned about our relation or relations with the other entities that exist in the world, both living and non-living. So this is the, the other big, the other big question in, in discussion. Um, uh, the aesthetic judgment is a very important one because this aesthetic connection to nature is usually a source of respect, appreciation, and enjoyment of the qualities of the natural settings. And in a way, it might be argued, I'm, I'm quite a, a, a big lot of philosophers argue that probably one of the things that the modern life has cut in us is our aesthetic connection with nature because we look at nature more, as I was saying, as a bigger store and not as an entity to which we depend from and therefore we have to respect and appreciate. And of course, enjoy the qualities of nature, but being a uh, control in doing so, right? Right, this is just some cartoons, you know, that try to put very um, uh, graphically all these uh, things I've been saying, you know. For instance, in Colombia recently, we have an animal protection law coming out. I think it was two or three years ago. However, clearly some of those members of that animal community are not respected or protected from that law. That's, and this uh, cartoon is trying to show you know that, right? Um, and this is another one, you know, coming from the um, medical bioethics, you know. And then this is the big question, as I was saying before, how do we demarcate the moral community in order to uh, respect, for instance, other species, animal species, or other living species, not just animal, different living species, including plants, for, for instance, including species in in danger of extinction, or even, for instance, to protect entire metha communities, like ecosystems, entire ecosystems. Probably, as, as you probably know, it's been around the world, uh, has been happening at least in the last 10 years, going back to that sort of awareness of the relationship and interdependence between social systems and natural systems. There have been this trend of, um, doing or, or calling um, ecosystems, entire ecosystems, as, as subjects of rights, right? In order for those ecosystems to be respected and to be cared for, right? So all this comes from this uh, very ethical and aesthetical discussion I've been, I've been trying to show, right? Right. I am moving now just to, to some final considerations. Um, I mean, we've done plenty of science and still we can do it and it's needed, but there's an excessive emphasis on epistemological aspects of the environmental phenomenon in terms of you know natural science epistemology, I would say, but there is an oversight or a lack of very important dimensions of this, of the environmental phenomenon. Dimensions like the political, the ethical, and the aesthetic dimensions of that environmental phenomenon in, in, most, part of, in most parts of the world. Uh, therefore, it seems that we need actually a new education focus on, on a dialogue of knowledges, not just the you know, scientific or a scholarly knowledge, but also a very practical knowledge, the practical wisdom that people sort of uh, distills from their day-to-day -day relationships with their environments. But in doing so, then critical thinking and other conceptions or representations of the world are a must, yeah? Uh, I mean, we need a change in our mental models where the respectful life and ecological integrity of the planet comes to be an important dimension in this environmental discourse 
and in, in environmental practices. And when I say respect for life, of course, primary respect for our own life, you know, human life, but also the life of the many thousands of other forms of life in the planet, right? And in order to do so, many ecologies are necessary to properly navigate this contemporary environmental crisis we are navigating nowadays. So we need political ecology, we need social ecology, philosophical ecology, and as one of the very uh, renowned authors of deep ecology movement calls it the ecological wisdom. For those of you who, who are interested in these more sort of philosophical topics, some references which are, I think, very good to get initiated in this discussion are the natural philosophy of Paul Feyerabend. I'm sorry that this is the picture of the book, but in Spanish, but it's natural philosophy, Paul Feyerabend. The imperative of responsibility from Hans Jonas. The phenomenon of life from the same author, Hans Jonas. And more recently, this is a very new book, the Arnes, who is one of the uh, founders of the deep ecology movement, the ecology of wisdom. Right, and I think with this, I am coming to a close. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. I will hand over to Professor Asmi for moderation of question and answers. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you, Fra Peña, for your interesting talk. It is very philosophical, uh, but I think it is interesting to hear such a philosophical uh, topic to be presented by a person with engineering background. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, I open uh, the floor for any questions uh, you can write down on the uh, chat box. Okay. There's a question from Professor Zol, our colleague. Uh, with regard to the payment for environmental services, is it really a one-way interaction, nature to human? I thought it is a powerful tool approach to make human being more responsible to pay the benefit that he gained from the nature, such as the polluters pay mechanism. Yeah, um, can I try to, to, to answer a bit? Yeah. Sure, sure. yes, yeah. I think, yes. I think uh, this is a very, very important point and topic, actually, because, you know, payment for environmental services is nowadays an economic tool used in many areas of the world to try to get conservation initiatives going on, you know. And, um, of course, as in anything, you know, there are opposers of the payment for environmental services and there are defenders of payment for environmental services. And I think, uh, for myself, I think it depends on the specific context or the specific scenario you are trying to put the, the, the scheme. I think, in, I think in many situations it may work well because for instance, you, you just can't tell a farmer to stop farming because he's degraded the environment uh, and do nothing else about it, you know, because in the end he has to live with his family. He has to get some form of revenue to be able to at least have a decent life. So I think in those, uh, let's say, contests of poverty, right? Um, I mean, this is a, a this might be a good way of, of giving an income to a family, a poor family, for instance, and then the family can sort of conserve, you know, keep in good condition a, a given part of an ecosystem, right? Um, and I think in those cases, it might work well. The problem is when the governments use this as a populist mechanism, you know, and they just give the promise and probably give you the money for one year functioning of the payment system and then they abandon it, which is what is happening in, 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 in many countries as well, you know. They do it this during the campaign. Once they are in power, they give the money for this scheme for one year and they forget about it, you know. <laughs> so in that way, that can be even worse, you know. So I think it depends. I mean, you have to see the specific context and the real uh, sort of engagement of the of the government or, or the, of the government or the, or the institution so that the scheme works properly, right? Okay. Any, thank you, uh, Professor, for the questions. Any other question? Okay. Uh, oh, uh, in, in one of your slides, uh, 
you yeah. show how the you, in one of your slide you show how the integration changes and then uh, from i think uh, from 1960s up to 2020 and from uh, within the years of 2020 we see the integration are uh, bilateral uh, between human and also the the, the nature yeah. so how does this changes uh, if we look Uh, according to the different uh, countries in, in terms of developing countries or uh, developed countries. And also uh, in, in our developing countries, we also have our uh, indigenous people uh, who are more connected to nature. So how do we characterize uh, this relationship? Yeah, uh, very good point, Ashley. I think uh, in our countries, for instance, we have a very sort of, um, I would say, complex reality because, you know, we are moving between being poor countries or underdeveloped countries to being more industrialized or at least developing countries. Mm -hmm. I think on, the, on that road, there are plenty of inequalities, you know, I mean, for people. So in our condition, we I just we can't think of a, a, a unique human nature relationship, as you said. You know the the very um, ancestral we call them or native communities live in a more harmonious uh, human nature relationship, but the rest of the society are more like in the sixties. You know where, where there's no connection, or we are just basically exploiting natural resources the fastest we can and the best we can, and mm -hmm. we don't care about environmental degradation. And that's exactly the path that developed, that developed countries nowadays follow between the 18th and the 19th century, right? Mm -hmm. And nowadays with international commerce and globalization, usually the exploitation moved to our lands. Mm -hmm. Usually we are uh, giving materials or, uh, yeah, to, to develop countries to do the transformation of natural materials, you see? So there's mm -hmm. imbalance move from one geography to the other, but they, we are suffering the impacts. Yeah. So I think that's the, that the thing we have to really be very serious about and think about, you know, how how, how we can reverse that or do it in a better way, you know, and not just repeat history again. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Uh, I don't see any question and I think we are almost come to the end of our talk but before that i have one question <laughs> uh, uh, how do actually what we what we can what can we do to enhance this bilateral relationship right yeah. very very good and very complex complex <laughs> question i think that's the that's the key question actually yeah. and um for instance some very um i mean there's some very interesting work now coming out i've been i've been reading and interacting with people from Texas University in the U.S., from Chilean universities here in South America. I mean, the, uh, the idea of keeping and enhancing biocultural diversity mm -hmm. seems to be a way to go about with this, you know. I mean, we, we have to worry really about uh, keeping and conserving natural biodiversity, but also cultural biodiversity. Yeah. And, and if we look at, at this, you see that Western Western society tends to standardize everything, you know, and in a way get rid of cultural diversity, right? Mm -hmm. Because the argument of bioculture is, is that by keeping both natural biodiversity and cultural biodiversity, what we are doing is we are giving liberty to different forms of living, different forms of relationship between humans and natural systems. And diversity is always best that, you know, mono, sort of mono situations, you know. Uh, so in a way, I think we are looking back to history and again trying to learn from these uh, native communities, you know, the very good practices they have, learn from that uh, and try to recover that, I think. And I think there should be like a balance, you know, not being so romantic as well that we have to be again, you know, living like, we were living two centuries ago, but try to find a midpoint, really, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay, uh, I think uh, since we don't have any other questions, uh, I would like to take this opportunity to thank uh, Fuafenya 
for your time. It was a very interesting talk that you gave us uh, to, re to make us realize on the importance of having a balanced relationship between human and also nature, uh, especially for, for, for our future generation. So thank you very much for your time. And now I would like to pass uh, the screen again to Professor Rafiq. Professor Rafiq. Thank you, Prof. Azmi, for chairing the session. And thank you as well for introducing Professor Miguel Peña Varon to me and to our distinguished speaker today, Professor Peña Varon. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Uh, this is certainly a unique session. Uh, talking about society and nature is very philosophical, as Prof. Azmi mentioned uh, just now. And it is good to hear from an engineer. So uh, excellent, <laughs> excellent topic uh, today. Certainly interesting. I've never been to Colombia, uh, Prof. Peña Varon. So looking forward to uh, see you in person, uh, especially after the COVID-19 pandemic is over. So again, thank you so very much for a great sharing session. And to uh, all... Professor, our, and to uh, all actually, our, uh, Prof. Peña came to us uh, last year. Oh, oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I was, I was, last I year. Was yeah. In, September last year, right? Wasn't it? Yeah. yeah. September last year. Yeah. In Sajaya. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So I miss I missed that opportunity to meet you last year then. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We were just sort of starting the project. It was our first assembly, right? Yeah, yeah yes, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah excellent. Well, welcome, Professor Rafik, and also ask me, of course, to come here. I think it seems we are gonna be having the next face-to-face -face assembly in Colombia if the pandemic sort of gets controlled somehow. We may see each other here in one year time. So more than welcome to to, to come thank here, you. Professor Rafik, and, and ask me, of course. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation. And thank you again for the great setting, sharing session today. And to all our worldwide viewers watching this UTM Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series, thank you so very much for watching. Do stay tuned because we have many more interesting lectures for you. Until next time, bye bye for now. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bye bye. Bye bye. Have a good day. See ya. Bye. See you tomorrow. See ya. Okay.